Mr. Imran Khan, Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan, to make his keynote address. <coughs> بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم یا کرا بدو و یا کرا ستائین سیکس جنرل وائسی حسین براہم تہا فورن منسٹر کگنم آف سعودی ریبیا پرنس فیصل بن فرحان السعود آنڈربل فورن منسٹر آف چائنا وینگی روائل ہائنسز Honorable Foreign Ministers, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen. First of all, let me welcome you with great joy and happiness on this uh, 48th. For welcome you with great joy and happiness on this uh, 48th. Foreign Minister's OIC meeting and it's being held in Islamabad at a time when we are celebrating our 75th anniversary of our independence. So I want to warmly welcome you. I hope you have a great stay here. And from the people of Pakistan, they are overjoyed that all of you are here and on this special occasion. Today I want to specially congratulate our OIC members because of a landmark resolution passed in the United Nations declaring 15th March as a day to combat Islamophobia. But I want to remind people why 15th of March. 15th of March was a day when a gunman walked into a mosque in New Zealand and shot dead 50 people. Why did he shoot them? Because he felt that all Muslims were terrorists. Where did this Islamophobia grow and was allowed to keep growing after 9-11. What happened after 9-11? Unfortunately, this narrative of Islamic terrorism, Islamic radicalism, this narrative went on unchecked. Respected foreign ministers, I have spent a lot of my life in England, touring all over the world as an international sportsman, and I understand the Western civilization probably much better than most people. I went to university there and then used to spend half my year playing sports in the summer in England. Now I saw this growing. After 9-11, this Islamophobia kept growing. And the reason was, I'm sorry to say, that we, the Muslim countries, did not do anything to check this wrong narrative. How can any religion have anything to do with terrorism? How was Islam equated with terrorism? And once that happens, how is the man in the street in Western countries, how is he supposed to differentiate between a moderate Muslim and a radical Muslim? How can he dif differentiate? Hence this man walks into a mosque and shoots everyone, everyone he could. Unfortunately, what should have been done and wasn't, the heads of Muslim countries should have taken a stand on this. But instead, a lot of our heads of state kept saying things like, well, we are moderate. 
the moment you say you're a moderate Muslim, you automatically say that there is some uh, extreme form of Islam. Our head of state at the time, after 9-11, he, he coined a phrase called enlightened moderation. I understand English better than most. I still don't know what it means. Enlightened moderation was a term to appease those who were relating terrorism to Islam. And unfortunately, as a result, there was this perception that there are different types of Islam. There's some radical Islam, there's some moderate, there's some liberal Islam. There is only one Islam. Islam of a Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no other Islam. In human communities, in every human community, you have your moderates, you have your liberals, you have your conservatives, it's a, you have your fanatics. Every human community has that. The man who walked into the mosque in New Zealand clearly was not a normal person. So, but why no other human community was branded with their religion? 1.5 billion people branded by this, these terms. And I'm, there always should be self-criticism because that's how you improve. Unless you analyze your mistakes, you can't improve yourself. So that was the biggest mistake we made. We did not challenge this narrative. And guess who suffered? Muslims living in Western countries. They kept suffering. Because any incident would happen, any terrorist incident by a Muslim, immediately meant that every Muslim became branded. When 9-11 happened, I still remember, people were petrified in Pakistan that I hope there was no Pakistani involved. How could we res be responsible, how could whole community be responsible for some fanatical deed by some extremists. So therefore, this was a big, it was one of the worst periods for Muslims living in uh, non-Muslim countries. And then, in 1989, there was a book called Satanic Verses written by a, a Muslim who knew, because he came from a Muslim family, he knew the reaction in the Muslim world amongst the Muslims if he insulted or mocked or ridiculed a Holy Prophet, peace be upon him. But what happened after 1989 was, rather than again the Muslim world coming up with an intellectual narrative, trying to explain to them that why do we feel, why are we so hurt when a holy prophet is ridiculed? Why does it hurt us so much? Living in and knowing the Western societies, I knew why they couldn't understand. Because they do not treat religion like we do. Jesus Christ does not, is not treated the way we in the West, the way we treat our holy prophet here. So they couldn't understand what was going on. Why were the demonstrations? Why were the death threats to Salman Rushdie? So they kept thinking that the Muslims do not allow freedom of expression. So Muslim world is intolerant. It doesn't allow freedom of expression. They were able to vilify our religion. And yet there was no coherent response from the Muslim world. And therefore, we kept into the cycle every few years, there would be some cartoons, insulting cartoons against our prophet. Every few years, there would be something uh, insulting him. We would respond. There would be some act of extremists. They would not respond. So this Islamophobia, the cycle, kept getting worse. And poor Muslims living in Western societies kept suffering. So that's why I'm really pleased that for the first time it has been acknowledged that Islamophobia is a reality and something needs to be done about it. And from now onwards, we hope 
that we will be able to put forward our narrative that why it hurts us so much. And honorable foreign ministers, let me just say that I only came into politics 25 years ago. I had one, I was watching this, uh, this uh, Islamophobia building up in Western societies. But two, I wanted my, my country. We were the only country which was which, were, which became independent in the name of Islam. And so, uh, the, 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 the objective resolution of our founding fathers was to make an Islamic welfare state based on the state of Medina. So I came into politics 25 years ago because that was my goal. And just in this uh, August gathering, let me just say, in the history of mankind, there was never a more just and humane, humane state. Unfortunately, our children don't know, know about it. We, even we in Muslim countries don't know that the modern state our Prophet created. Forget about Western countries or non-Muslims. How would they know about it when we ourselves don't understand that he created a state which laid the foundation of one of the greatest civilizations in human history for the next few hundred years. And that foundation was laid in the state of Medina. So what was that foundation? This is again what most people don't understand. And I'm glad that Foreign Minister Wang Yi is here because I, I want people to understand what was it that caused this great revolution, one of the greatest revolutions of all times. The state of Medina was one of the greatest revolutions. What was it? Number one, our Prophet was given the title in our holy book, the Quran, as Ramatulil Alameen, mercy for mankind, not mercy for Muslims. He came as a mercy for mankind. He came to unite mankind, not divide mankind. Uh, Allah for Muslims is Ramat, Rabbul Alameen, not Rabbul Muslimin. We do not understand, we Muslims don't understand the great mission a prophet came in this world for, to unite humanity. The Charter of Medina was signed with Jews, with Christians, with Sabians, and with pagans. All became part of a human community. We don't even realize that in 10 years which the Prophet came to Medina and then he left this world, people think that it was, you know, through conquests and through, through the sword. Hardly anyone knows that in these 10 years, there were only about 1,200 people who were killed in battles. In these 10 years, 1,200 people died and Islam spread all over Arabia. So it was a revolution of ideas. He created a new system. It's the state of Medina, he created the best rule of law. The basis of a, a civilized society is rule of law. His saying, that even if my daughter commits a crime, she will be punished. No one is above law. His saying that many nations before you have been destroyed, where the powerful crooks were exempted, were given immunity, and poor crooks were put into jail. If you look at the world right now, Excellencies, I can tell you, just look at all the poor countries. Look at the countries which have poverty. There will be one thing in common. They cannot catch the white-collar criminals. They only end up putting petty criminals in jail. This is the biggest problem which a prophet, peace be upon him, predicted almost 1,500 years ago. The developing world is poor not because they lack resources 
because they cannot put the powerful criminals on, uh, in jail. Uh, there's a fact I panel report by Secretary General of the United Nations. According to this report, and this will shock all of you, that every year, every year, $1.6 trillion leave the poor countries and end up in tax havens and in the developed world. $1.6 trillion, according to the fact I panel report of the UN Secretary General. Just imagine what is going on. Poor countries are being robbed simply because we cannot put the powerful criminals in jail. We cannot bring them under the rule of law. This is what our prophet predicted. And this, this was the state of Medina where he set up this system of rule of law. No one above. And, and two of the first four Khalifas, two of the first four heads of state of Medina ended up in court of law. And one of the most revered and respected figures of Islam, who was the fourth Khalifa, he loses a case against a Jewish citizen because the judge refused to, who was the fourth Khalifa, he loses a case against a Jewish citizen because the judge refused to accept the testimony of his son. This was the justice system there which laid the foundation of this great civilization. So what does it show? Number one. Number one. That minorities were equal citizens. They were equal citizens in front of law. There was no discrimination. Secondly, it shows that a common citizen could win a case against the head of state. No one was above law. This is 600 years before the Magna Carta was uh, 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 signed in, in England, uh, which was the beginning of the democratic struggle of, the, of Britain. And it took them years before they could actually bring their head of state under the rule of law. This is what happened in the state of Medina. It was ahead of its time. And then it was the first welfare state in the history of mankind. Compassion, humanity. It was a state which took care of its weak, its orphans, its widows, its poor people. It was the first time pensions were introduced in the state of Medina. They took care of the old people. A compassionate state. A state where they wanted to please the Almighty. How do you please the Almighty Allah? By looking after his human beings, especially the weak. This is what happened in the state of Medina. And today, I feel sad whenever I go to Scandinavia, I see what a welfare state should be in all over the Muslim world. Look at humanity there. Look at the way they look after the weak. In fact, sometimes I, I'm sad because some, they look after the animals better than some of us look after our human beings. And remember, He's Ramatullah Alameen, so whoever listened to his message, whichever human community will prosper. It doesn't matter because he's, for all humanity, he brought the message of mercy. If you, if you look at Switzerland, in the, in the rule of law index, Switzerland is 99%. 99%, so with hardly any resources, it is one of the most prosperous countries in the world. So as I said, anyone who goes by the, modern, or the, the model of Medina will prosper. And then, quest for knowledge. Foreign Minister uh, Wang, Li, Wang Yi, you would be surprised, one of our prophets saying, he said, even if you have to go to China, to, uh, to uh, learn and quest for knowledge, you must go there. Now, what it, first, China at that time was center of knowledge, but it meant even risking your life, going from, at that time, Arabia to China, meant you might not come back. So that was the quest of knowledge. You have to seek knowledge from cradle to grave. 
He sparked off this great knowledge revolution. For hundreds of years, the top scientists were Muslims because they thought quest for knowledge was a sacred duty. Look at the situation in the Muslim world today. How much do we have a quest for knowledge? And then we get so much... Wherever you go, Muslims are... That our women are... We imprison our women. Our women have no rights. And sometimes, uh, you know, it almost seemed that the, the U.S. invaded Afghanistan to liberate the women. There was no other reason except to liberate the women. Somehow our women are in prison. Let me just tell you that the, it was a revolutionary move by a prophet that women were given inheritance rights. They were empowered. In Europe, even 100 years ago, the women barely got their inheritance rights. 1,500 years ago, women were given their rights. And no one seems to know this. And sadly, cultural issues are equated to our, our religion. We cannot explain. Sometimes Western people say they confuse culture with religion. I'm sad to say in Pakistan, we discovered 70% of our women do not get inheritance rights. So we have especially had to pass law to ensure, enforce, that women must get their inheritance rights. This is 1,500 years later. And no one knows this. Slaves, honorable foreign ministers, nowhere in human history has this happened. That slaves became kings. The Mamluks were slaves who became kings in Egypt. In India, there was slave dynasty that became kings. Why? Because the prophet said, treat your slaves as family members. Best to best to uh, free them, if not, treat them as equal family members. So he was the greatest human being that ever stepped foot. There will never be a human being like them. Anyone close to the Prophet became leaders. If you read the book, uh, The Arab Conquest, everyone became a leader, whoever was near the Prophet. And ah, Generations don't understand that, and neither have we been able to explain to anyone else. We do, let's not confuse Muslim imperialism with the 10 years of Prophet in Medina. Let's not confuse that, because that was not what the Prophet preached, where the Muslims went all over the world conquering. It is not what the Prophet prophets. The whole revolution was of ideas. Um, Honorable Foreign Ministers, one of the ideas of uh, OIC is to protect Islamic values. So now I will say something which is completely different. I, have, I believe that Islamic values never have been so much under threat as they are right now. And I bring this to this uh, August Assembly because when I became the Prime Minister, I asked the police chief asked him what the crime chart I was amazed to note that sex crime child abuse and rape is the fastest growing crime in this country so we did further in investigation we discovered that the mobile phone the sort of pornographic material available on the mobile phone to children this has never happened in human history so the material available is causing havoc in our society without us knowing. Parents don't know what's happening when the, ch when the child goes into his room or something. They don't know what he's watching on his mobile phone. It is very important that this August Forum, we should plan how to combat this because it is, going, it is already having a huge impact. We have a rise in divorces. We all know that the more vulgarity, the more a society gets permissive, it has a direct impact on the family system. One of the most important things about Islam is that our religion protects the family system. We have values like we respect parents, we have respect for our teachers, but the, 
But the culture that is coming through, social media, we really need to think carefully how we're going to protect our generations. I have formed in Pakistan a Rahmatullah Alameen authority of scholars. The whole purpose is how are we going to give an alternate point of view to our children, cartoons, how do we, because children get influenced from that age onwards, how do we strengthen our children against this, this uh, unpredictable uh, social media revolution? How do we know where it is going? So I think that I, I thought at this meeting I should mention because we need to think, start thinking about alternate media, how we can compare. You can't stop social media, but we can give our children, fortify them, strengthen them ethically and morally. Now I come to, uh, you know, two important political issues. One is Palestine and the other is Kashmir. Honorable Foreign Ministers, we have failed both the Palestinians and the people of Kashmir. I'm sad to say that we, we have been able to make no impact at all. They don't take us seriously. We are a divided house. And those powers know it. We are 1.5 billion people. And yet, our voice to stop this blatant injustice is insignificant. We are not talking about conquering some country. We are simply talking about the human, the human rights of the people of Kashmir and Palestine. The international law which is on their side, United Nations Security Council resolutions that back their right in, in Kashmir, the international community promised them the right to decide their own destiny through a plebiscite. That right was never given to them. In fact, the special status of Kashmir was taken away illegally by India in, on 5th August 2019. Nothing happened. Because they are not, they feel no pressure. They feel we are just too, we can make a resolution and then, you know, back to our usual business. I'm not talking about altering our foreign policies. All of us countries have our different foreign policies. But on core issues, I am asking the OIC that unless we have a united front, we will keep these abuses will happen. Like in Palestine, I mean, it's daylight robbery going on in Palestine. The only hope I have is now because of social media, first time in Western countries, there's awareness of what's going on to the poor Palestinians. That is a, so far much more than the OIC. It's the mobile phone and the spread of, of uh, information. Of, of the injustices being done to the Palestinians, that is the best, at the moment, the best way to uh, protect them, not us. In Kashmir, it's a war crime, according to the Fourth Geneva Convention, to change the demography of an occupied land. India is changing the demography of Kashmir by making the Muslims from a majority to a minority by bringing in settlers from outside. This is a war crime. Yet no one has pushed about it. Neither India has pushed nor Israel because they think we are ineffective. So, uh, Honorable Foreign Ministers, let me just say that the way, the way the world is headed, I'm afraid it's, it's headed the wrong way. There's a Cold War. Uh, almost started, there is a chance of world being divided into blocks. We 1.5 billion people, unless we are united, unless we take a united stand, we'll be nowhere. As what I'm scared to say where the future is headed right now. Um, before I come to Ukraine, I just want to talk about Afghanistan. It is extremely important that we stabilize Afghanistan. After 40 years and no 
nation has suffered as the people of Afghanistan. 40 years of conflict. Finally, there is no conflict going on. The only danger now to Afghanistan is that through the sanctions and not non-recognition, they might end up having a humanitarian crisis. Already the people are falling below the poverty line. Already there's a brain drain going on. So it's extremely important that we help the people of Afghanistan. And I say this because a stable Afghanistan is the only way, I repeat, it's the only way we are going to be able to stop international terrorism from Afghan soil. No other country is going to be able to do it. Let's not be delusional that some other country will come in and, and sort of through drones or something fight terrorism. It's not going to happen. The only hope is a stable Afghanistan government that can take care of international terrorism. I want to add a word of caution. Anyone who knows the Afghan character should be cautioned that please do not push the pe people of Afghanistan to do things where they feel that their sovereignty is being threatened. They are very proud, independent-minded people. They have always fought for their to do things where they feel that their sovereignty is being threatened. They are very proud, independent-minded people. They have always fought for their sovereignty for hundreds of years. They do not like the idea that someone is dictating to them. So I would caution that let's help them, let's encourage them, let's uh, get them involved in the international community. And I believe that the people of Afghanistan are strong enough to evolve and go in the right direction. But please let's remember that the Afghan character does not like outside interference. Uh, and finally, I come to Ukraine. Um, I'm like I think everyone here and the rest of the world, we're all worried about what's going on there. Um, may I suggest that uh, the OIC, during its discussions, the foreign ministers, we should think about how we the one point, represent 1.5 billion people, how we can med mediate, how we can bring about a ceasefire, how we can try and put an end to the conflict. I'm going to meet uh, His Excellency Wang Yi uh, after this, and I want to discuss how maybe OIC along with China, how we can all step in and try to stop this this uh, conflict which is going to have, if it keeps going the way it is, it will have great consequences for the rest of the world. I have, uh, I have already, as, a, as, a head of, uh, as a head of the government here, I can tell you that we are already suffering. Oil prices have gone up, gas prices have shot up, wheat prices have gone up because of this war. And if this keeps continuing, this is only going to get worse. So therefore, we should, all the countries which are non-partisan, this is, we, we are in a special position to be able to influence uh, this conflict. So as I said, I would uh, want the foreign ministers, Shah Mahmood Qureshi, please discuss with the other foreign ministers. Uh, and I will uh, discuss with uh, his Excellency, the Chinese Foreign Minister, how we can all, as a, uh, as a bloc, OIC and China, how we can influence the uh, uh, events in, in Ukraine and, and, and stop this and have some ceasefire and resolve this conflict. Lastly, uh, Honorable Foreign Ministers, let me again say what a pleasure it was to welcome you to my beautiful country. I want to end by saying Again, I repeat that the world is moving in a direction which is uh, sadly worrisome for all of us. In block politics, in Cold War, and let's just 1.5 billion people, is a, we keep underestimating the strength we have. Somehow we lack self-belief. As a sportsman, I can tell you that a team that has self-belief 
will defeat a team that is far more talented but doesn't have self-belief. We don't have self-belief. We somehow look to others to help us and get justice. But as where the world is headed, it is extremely important that we get united and on certain core issues take a stand. And let's not be dragged into this, into blocks, into the conflicts. We should stay as a block and show our power in 